Well, good evening, everybody. This is Ken Cavula from the Mid-Michigan Chapter of Better Investing, and this is the March 2024 Investing Roundtable. This program is sponsored by the Mid-Michigan Chapter of Better Investing and also by Manifest Investing. And tonight we have with us the chairman and CEO and, and prime bottle washer and everything else to do with Manifest Investing, Mark Robertson. He's also my good buddy and friend, and Mark is going to present us stock this evening and we're also joined by Kim Butcher. Kim's a, a popular stock analyst, stock picker. She does a really wonderful job of coming up with companies that a lot of times uh, are under the radar for us and I think tonight she's really got one that's quite a bit under the radar for you to take a look at. Uh, again, this is <laughs> south of what? the equator. <laughs> again, <laughs> the March investing roundtable. Uh, we're <laughs> looking at Easter in less than a week. And so we're honoring Easter with the two bunnies on the front. You can decide which one is Mark and which one is Ken. Okay, I'm not <laughs> quite sure. All right, uh, let's move on to the next slide where we are just letting you know that this is uh, an educational presentation and any stocks that we talk about, even though we're going to be talking about real stocks in real time, we're not making any recommendations as to buy, sell, or hold. We expect you to decide whether or not the stocks we talk about are appropriate for your consideration and are appropriate for inclusion in your portfolio. We think our audiences are smart enough to make those decisions on their own. Everything we're doing is to illustrate all of the techniques that are used in the modern investment club movement and to illustrate how well some well-informed amateurs can do if they really put their minds to it. If you did not receive email reminders about tonight's roundtable, you can be added to our guest list by dropping a line to ncavula1 at comcast.net. That's my lovely wife, and she keeps control of our guest list, and she'll help you get on to our guest list so that you receive one email a month from us reminding you about the roundtable and allowing you to register if you so desire. If you'd like copies of all the slides from this evening, you can drop an email to Mark R at Manifest in investing.com and Mark would be glad to get you copies of those slides. If you have comments or questions, those are our email addresses at the bottom of the slide and we'd be happy to engage in a conversation with you about things that go on at the round table. Uh, without any further ado, let's start the program on slide number one. This is our performance to date. And this goes back uh, over 13 years. We're in our 14th year right now in the round table. And you can see that our relative return has gone from 6% above the market to around 4% above the market. Uh, our goal is to stay above that dotted orange line on the graph. And you can see that we've just moved a little bit below it at the moment. As long as we can bounce around below above, below, above, and stay near that line, we're very, very happy. What that means is that if we're at the line, we're beating the appropriate benchmark, in this case, the Wiltshire 5000, we're beating that benchmark by at least five points. Tonight, uh, our total return since inception is 16.2% annualized. In that same period of time, the Wiltshire 5000 has done 12% annualized. So our relative return is 4.2%. Mark missed the 0.2, but we'll give him a, a credit for the oh, 4% man. no matter what. Oh, man. Right. Oh, how does that happen? I don't know. <laughs> our accuracy goal, uh, the number of stocks in our tracking portfolio, which we're trying to uh, follow very religiously, our accuracy goal is 55%. We've been doing some work with Tillengast, and Tillengast suggests that a really good stock picker should be aiming to beat the market 55% of the time. That gives you lots of room to strike out, folks, but it does set a standard 
that tells you how well you're doing against what an outside quote expert unquote feels you you might be able to do right now as of tonight our outperformance accuracy is 48.1 percent so we have a number of stocks that are close to beating the market but are just a little bit underneath where they need to be at the moment we're going to kind of watch those and we would love to move that back up at least above 50 and up towards 55%. Again, we've been doing this for 14 years. So the numbers in that dark blue box with the red arrow pointing at it right now, that's a 13 year plus number. And to do that for 13 years, to return 16.2% annualized for 13 plus years is, in our opinion, quite an achievement for a bunch of folks that do this as a hobby. Uh, we're quite proud of what goes on in the round table, and uh, we like to show you everything that we possibly can show you. So let's look at the next slide real quickly. Here's the top 20 or so holdings in the round table by percent. You can see that even though we've only chosen Microsoft four times uh, during the, uh, I'm sorry, five okay. times during the uh, uh, sessions, it's grown to over $105,000, $107,000 almost. Uh, you can tell that we've chosen it five times by looking at that legend in the upper left-hand corner. There's that 5X, and there's a list of companies after the 5X that we've chosen four times. The biggest choice has been Cognizant, which we've chosen 15 different times, and the $15,000 that we've put into Cognizant has now grown grown to $26,292. There's a couple on this list that you won't find on the legend, and you won't find them on the legend because they've only been chosen once. Costco, down about a little bit below the halfway point on this list. Costco is a single choice, a one-time $1,000, and it's turned into $15,000. Our only mistake is not choosing it more than a single time. Uh, when it ever does get back in the buy zone, I'm hoping that some of the Knights notice that and put in another choice or two for us to to help our portfolio move forward. If you'd like to see the entire roundtable tracking portfolio, and this is a little bit different than a club portfolio. This is all of our choices that we've made in the 13 plus years we've been in existence, and some of the positions are frozen. We've sold them, but most of the positions are still active. You can go to that link up there. It's a free link, and it'll show you the entire round table dashboard, all the stocks that we own and what their value happens to be at the time you bring the dashboard up. Let's go to the next slide if we could. And we're going to start our stock presentations right off the bat this evening. Uh, again, we're hoping to maybe move out of here sometime around 930 tonight. So uh, we're, of course, eager to answer your questions. And I do have, uh, uh, no, I'm just getting a thank you from one of our audience members for our before the the bell discussion. So I'm going to present a, a stock that might be new to a lot of folks. And uh, it's Excel Service Holdings. Folks, I do not know why EXL is on the investor relations front page and on every single investor relations slide. The kicker for Excel Service Holdings is EXLS. So I just have to think that the company calls itself in-house calls itself Excel, and the easiest way to write that is EXL. <laughs> so with that in mind, let's go to the next slide if we could. Excel Service is a fairly new company, 
and you can see that it really is quite impressive uh, the clients who count on them uh, in the world. Excel has a really deep presence in the United States and in the United Kingdom. And you can see that nine of the top 10 U.S. insurance, for example, use Excel service holdings uh, to help them analyze their data and their digital operations. Uh, we'll talk about exactly what Excel does, but you can see that it's quite impressive uh, the uh, classy clients that the company has. Uh, they basically look at companies in the insurance industry, in the healthcare industry, and in the emerging industries, and that's kind of a catch-all for things that are new. Uh, they're much larger than you might expect them to be. They have over 50,000 employees, and their 2022 annual revenue was 1.4 billion, and the revenue was growing at that point from 2006 to 2022 at about 18%. They're growing very quickly, like a small company, and probably if we were to put them into the right category, Mark and I would classify them as a small company as well. In fact, in October of this year, when we put out our best small companies list, we classified Excel Services as a small, fast-growing company, and we put it on our short list of companies for 2024. If you go back and look at some of our uh, uh, projects, some of our, our uh, presentations on the YouTube website, you'll be able to see that we put that list out there and have talked about it a number of different times. This is the first time we're going to bring a presentation primarily on Excel service to our audiences. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see that they basically have four reportable uh, segments. There's the healthcare that we spoke about, the insurance that we spoke about, and the emerging markets or the emerging ideas that uh, we spoke about. And they include those all within digital operations and solutions. They also have a large data analytics uh, business, almost half of their entire business. So two primary businesses and reporting in four different segments. What that really means is that you can dive into their quarterly reports or their annual reports, and you can get numerical breakdowns for each of these reportable segments. You can see how well they're doing versus the year before and the year before that, and you can see how the business in those different segments is increasing or decreasing. I can tell you that right now, one of the faster growing segments of the four is the data analytics segment, uh, and it looks to maybe be moved to 50% or higher uh, of the entire business in the next year or two. Next slide, please. I like it when a company is able to turn jargon and gibberish into something that most people can understand. And I'm hoping that if you take a moment and think about this wheel that's on the right of this slide, starting at the 12 o'clock position on the wheel, I'm hoping you can get a really great idea of what the company actually does. They start in their analytics section, the fastest growing section. They start by gathering data from their customer. And they also coordinate that with any similar data from similar customers. They put that data on the cloud, and then they structure the data. They have different uh, ways of structuring that data so that they can run analytical models on the data. What that means is they can use this buzzword of AI, 
and their proprietary analytical models have been using AI for longer than AI has been something that everybody has been talking about. They've been doing this now for a couple of years and suddenly it's become quite fashionable to be involved with AI. I think you might say that Excel Services has a little bit of a head start on a lot of companies that are just beginning to explore the use of artificial intelligence. What they do after they run these models is they talk to their clients, they talk to their customers, and they deliver ideas that might in fact make the business run more quickly, more smoothly, or more profitably. When they deliver these ideas to their clients, they're not suggesting that the client do anything to change the business, but they're giving the client a list of ideas that they might consider. Once the client decides what they're going to do with those insights, then the insights can be used to measurably improve the business itself whether it's to quicken a process or reduce paperwork in a process or maybe make a profit process more profitable. Whatever the insight points to, if the business chooses to implement the recommendation, whatever it might happen to be, then the business has a relatively decent chance of improving its business model. And this wheel turns on a yearly basis where the Excel service people are continually gathering the data, migrating it to the cloud, structuring it and running the analytic models, and then continually delivering business insights to its clients to consider implementing for the business. I think that while that's a little bit complicated, I think most people can understand how AI fits in to the entire process. Notice over on the left-hand side, there are 8,000 plus data scientists dealing with this part of the Excel business. Excel makes a big point in their investor presentation about the relationship that they have with 25 of the best engineering schools in the nation and how they attract talent from those 25 schools to help them maintain this analytics business and to improve it over time. An AI model will get better the more you use it and the longer you use it. AI models are something that you can hear about in the news when you turn on almost any business channel, but here's where they're actually being implemented and used to create ideas for businesses to improve their profitability or their efficiency. Uh, the models that are being used are recognized by industry experts such as Gartner or Everest, and they are helping clients have a large return on invested income. So with that, let's look at the next slide. Here's the growth that AI represents for half of the business model. And I'm not going to read this slide to you, but I would suggest that you might want to ask Mark for copies of the slides and read it yourself. In fact, I might want to suggest, and it won't be the last time tonight, but I might want to suggest you go to the Excel service website and you take some time, if you're interested in the company, to really, really explore not only their investor presentation, but the very thoughtful reports that they put out quarterly and at the end of every fiscal year. I think you'll find them easy to understand and the company really goes to great lengths to make sure that the stuff they put out has a meaning to an average person. Next slide. 
Here's a chart coming from the Everest Group. This is one of the, the kinds of companies that measures the quality of different industries. And here's the Everest Group in 2022. It's the most recent chart available for the digital platforms and augmentation in the insurance business systems. So we're looking at this and we're seeing the vision and the capability along the bottom, along the X axis, and the market impact along the right axis. And the better you get, the higher you get to the upper right hand corner of this, of, of this matrix, the better the company is. I know many of you will recognize the name Cognizant or Accenture or Genpact or maybe even WNS. But I'm wondering how many of you will actually recognize the name XL Services. Again, ticker EXLS, okay? Uh, Everest Group seems to think that XL Services is one of the top companies in this particular piece of the business that they operate in. Next slide, please. Much of their business is annuity based. And what that basically means is it's covered by long term contracts. These contracts are about four to five years in length. They're quite sticky. Uh, once a customer signs a contract with you, they tend to maintain those contracts over long periods of time. And notice how the proportion of annuity business has increased in the last three years. On the bar graphs, the annuity business is represented by the light blue and the project-based business, the shorter length contracts are uh, uh, signified by the darker blue. So the annuity-based business gives this company some very high visibility as to earnings and revenue out into the four to five year time period. Next slide. Again, I'm not gonna read this to you. Again, if you're very interested in Excel services, I would ask you to go to their website and take a look at the investor presentation. I've only chosen six or seven slides from that 60 or 65 slide uh, collection on their website. Uh, you'll certainly learn a lot more than I can teach you in this very short presentation to Excel Service Holdings. Next slide. Here we go to the SSG right now. Uh, I hope most of you by this time are familiar with the SSG Plus. I certainly think that's an upstraight and parallel example for you to take a look at. Uh, notice that the analyst consensus estimates going forward, uh, and these numbers are coming from Morningstar, uh, are are pretty pretty decent. They're double digits, almost 11% for sales, and that's the number that I've brought down into my forecast uh, for the next five years. And the earnings number for five years, uh, Morningstar is calling it 15, and that's the number I've brought down as well. Now, I haven't just copied those numbers. I've compared those numbers to the 10-year, or in this case, the seven-year growth rate, uh, I did knock off the oldest three years to get the trend lines to match up to the data uh, as closely as I could. And I think forecasting 11% growth on a company that for the last seven years has grown at 13 is certainly on the conservative side. And forecasting 15% revenue growth for a company that has grown revenues at 26.5% over the last seven years is also a fairly conservative call. Notice on the evaluate management sections of the company, I'm getting good, strong profit margins that are consistent and slightly growing as we move uh, from 2019 to 2023. 
I'm getting superb return on equity up at 20 or higher than 20% in the most recent two years. And they're doing it with very acceptable, acceptable debt to capital. And in fact, the debt seems to be on a downward trend at the moment. Uh, pretty good management comparisons. There is no value line analysis sheet. There's an extended value line report with data on it, but no analysis. And there is no Morningstar analysis report to give me guidance from the analyst community. I did check some of the online sources and I get an ACE number from the Yahoo site that is quite similar to the ACE numbers coming from Morningstar, the 10.8 and the 15 coming from Morningstar. So I feel comfortable with my projections, although I'm doing a lot of it from experience rather than reading an analyst to give me some extra support. Next slide. I'm looking at the historic PE values and the five-year averages for Excel services are 38.3 at the high side, 22.7 at the low side. I bumped that 38.3 down to something close to the most recent fiscal year, and I chose 32 as the high PE average for the next five years. I kept the low average, which was 23, 22.7, almost 23, and I kept that for the next five years as well. Uh, that gives me a good solid buy, a seven to one upside downside, and a par value. And I like to look at par and total return, a par value of 14.5%, a total return of 18%. And if I were presenting this to my club, I would suggest that if we were to sell this stock in five years, we have a good chance of making somewhere in that interval on the sale. These are annualized numbers, so somewhere between 14.5% and 18%. One more slide, Mark, please. I copied that uh, summary again, and I indicate that I'm a member of the B.I. Baker Model Club, and we've owned Excel services for about six months. I also own this stock personally. It appears on the best small companies list, and I really like the fact that my 14.5% par value seems to be validated by Manifest's par call of 16.6. .6. I think those numbers are close together to call them in the same ballpark, and that validates the study that I've done on this particular company. One more slide, and I'm out of here, Mark. Okay. I was looking for a stock with significant commitment to AI. Uh, everybody's talking about AI. Everybody in my clubs wants to find an AI stock. And I did not go and look in the chips industry or the chips services industry or the chips material or chips machines industry. I went and looked at something completely different. And this is a business services company that uses AI in its typical work. Uh, I would sincerely recommend that you go to their website and check out all the presentations that are there, but especially the January investor presentation. It's current. It talks about things that are actually happening. It makes comments about how they think they're going to make money going into the future. And it covers so many of the things that we ask people to research when they're doing their research on a stock selection guide. It's crammed with explanations. And that's that's what our folks are looking for many times as they're trying to make a decision to buy, sell, and hold. I hope you'll consider Excel Service Holdings, EXLS, for an addition to the roundtable portfolio. Thanks, Ken. And we'll switch yeah. to yeah. Kim's I'm gonna... cruise to, to Latin America. Yeah, let's go south. Um, I'm going to present Liberty Latin America. The call letters are L-I-L-A. Um, I went uh, 
searching through one of my favorite little sources called dataroma.com. As you can see here, uh, since October, the stock price has been up and down, but really what really happened uh, when the stock market went down there is February the 23rd, they gave quarterly results and it was not what the market expected and we had a great response, probably a little bit overboard which sometimes makes it really for a good buy. So let's see what we can find here. Next slide. Now this is John Malone. Uh, Hannah and I cannot believe you don't know this name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> John Malone is known as the Cable Cowboy. He is one of the great unsung heroes of our age uh, who is, he's defined the cable industry. I mean, for 25 years, he's dominated this industry with the sh in the world of entertainment and communications, first with his cable company, TCI, and later with Liberty Media. He's also the one that has developed, because he doesn't like paying the government any taxes, he would have a whole floor full of tax accountants to learn how to avoid paying taxes. And in doing that, he learned that he could do you could have a lot of um, subsidiaries underneath the one name of the company, and then he could spin them off. He developed spinoffs. And he, uh, under his uh, Liberty Media, he spun off Liberty Cirrus, Liberty Formula One, and there's a third one in there for the life of me. I can't think of it right now. Liberty Braves. Liberty Braves. And all three of those are doing pretty good. And I know that Cy is probably really happy with Liberty Braves. <laughs> uh, um, the thing is, is he also likes all his um, deals to be such that he likes his management to understand what's going on and they all need to own some shares in it. And he likes to combine services for consolidations and then to get high fat margins. Uh, He's developed this all in the U.S. and now he's developing it all in South America. Next slide. So I went to Data Roma today and I have my little screen technique. Everybody has theirs. Um, DataRoma.com is a free site and I like to be greedy. I want to find out if they have skin in the game. So my, my screening was going to the insiders and then I screen for, they have to be a director, a 10% owner on uh, management. And I want skin in the game. So I wanna know who's bought what, and they spent a million dollars of their own money on it. Well, look at that. On March 22nd, and this is when the stock price hit its low about $6 and 13 cents. It was purchased by, uh, John Malone on the 22nd for $6.7893 for $3.2 million. And then later in the day, he purchased some more stock and he got it at $6.71 for a total cost of $3.25 million. So yes, he's putting skin in the game. Now, what is this percentage of the amount of money he has? Because Mark asked me that question. I don't know, but Anybody's got millions and they're putting into a stock because there's only one reason insiders buy shares. And we learned this from Peter Lynch. And it's because they know what's going on and it's going to be a good stock. Next slide. Then I found an article saying that director Paul Gould had purchased 300,000 shares of Liberty Latin America on March 22nd. So you've got a 10% owner and a director buying shares. Now this increased his number of shares by 109% when he purchased all these extra shares. So he's really putting skin into the game and he's doubled the amount of outstanding shares he owns. And the biggest thing I always look for, is this a direct purchase or an indirect purchase? An indirect purchase is when an insider is getting the shares as a reserve stock unit or it's a payout for being on the board. This is where they have to put their own back pocket money. They're putting skin in their game with their own money for it. 
And the total, my data room was that there were eight buys worth $8.7 million purchased of LIA Liberty um, Latin America purchased within, and I looked at the dates and I went, whoa, this is within the last pretty much week. The stock closed today at $6.89. Next slide. So within very similar amount. And then I found an article on Simply Wall Street. They're thinking that by the um, stock price is undervalued. as well. It's fair valued at $12.74 because the market doesn't realize what's going on with the shares by their discounted cash flow model. So here's a stock that could be really valued at $12.74 and it's selling at $6.89. Uh, that's, we're getting real close to our double already. Next slide. This is what they do. They are in, 20 different countries across Latin America and the Caribbean, and they have five different consumer brands. They're in the communications entertainment services that they offer to residential and business customers in this region, including digital, broadband, internet, telephone, and mobile services. The business products and services include enterprise grade connectivity, a data center, hosting and managed solutions, as well as IT solutions with customers from small to medium enterprises to international companies and government agencies. They also have a subsea and terrestrial fiber optic cable network that, that connects approximately 20 mar or 40 markets within the region. There are class A, a, B, and C shares. The difference is class A is one share equals one vote, class B is one share equals 10 votes, and class C is no, you have the shares and no votes. But here it is. In the networks and IT, they're targeting to have 80% of network enabled for gigabyte speed, which will be 95% of that market by the end of 2024. They're trying to shut down all copper networks across their markets. They're getting, getting migrating new customers, 80% uh, of them into new wireless core and they're getting them into 5G. So they're giving them a PR and some trials uh, with discounts so that they can get new customers. They're getting lower churn from customers, improve the customer service with the digital sales by greater than 20% this year. They wanna develop new products with business to business. Their consumer care is quick connect inst installation and self-care app adoption. So just like everyone else, you've got an app if you've got any problems. They've sold off a whole bunch of their towers. So they're gonna take that money from selling off cell phone towers and help pay down debt. They're going to look to see if they have any acquisitions of Spectrum and uh, PR subscribers in Puerto Rico. They're buying back shares and converting redemptions of bonds. Their balance sheet has been developing and that OIBDA is their uh, definition of operating income or loss before share-based compensation, depreciation, and modernization. And they're evaluating their opportunities. Next slide. Yes, they have debt, 8.2 billion, leveraged at 4.2 times. 96% of it is not due until 2027 and beyond, and that's a 6% interest rate on average. But they've been increasing their free cash flow. Cash pays the bills, so that's always great. Their medium to long-term targets in three years prior to when this debt is due is they expect to have single digit, mid to high single digit cash adjusted growth rate. PE addition to the revenue of 16% growth, 
aggregated adjusted free cash flow of greater than one billion dollars. That's going to help bring down the debt with everything else that's going on. Next slide. Okay, this is the value line that came out March the 8th. Over here, I love looking at the projections box. Granted, I have a little bit of greed. I like a minimum of a 10% as my low return value line. They're the professional people. Say 29% versus a high projection of 49%. That is in five years. I'm not complaining. Now, what you need to know is the PE ratio of no meaningful financial data. Everything is in, why? Because they've had negative earnings. Ken, I'm gonna make you happy because I'm gonna show you where this company by value line is going to start returning positivity in having positive earnings. So I feel like this is one of those St. Louis stocks where they're finding those stocks that are flipping the, Flipping the page and they're going into profitability. Next slide. Okay. When I looked at this and what got me going is if you look at their revenues, what is it consistently showing? Since 2020, it is consistently gradually creeping straight up. And if we're right now at $24, they think in five years, it's going to be $31.60. So that's a growth of at $2.22 to get to 31. That's a lot of growth. Cash flow per share, we're going to go for this year at $5.60 to $7.90. They believe they will be cash earning positive at 80 cents this year, and they will double that to 2029 to a dollar 60. Next, I like looking at their book value per share. It was at nine dollars and seventy cents this year, is what they think it's going to be this year. And then going forward, it's going to be out to thirteen dollars and forty-five cents. We've got a lot of growth going on here. They're talking about how their common share is outstanding. They're going to be reducing shares, buying them back. Before you had no meaningful data because you had negative earnings. You can't get a PE without having positive earnings. What's gonna happen? We're gonna have a PE of 14. That means we're also gonna have, prob we're gonna have a price increase because we're gonna have positive earnings. So there you go. And that's a low PE, folks. Our revenues going forward are going to continue to go up from 48, 4,800 to 6,200. Our margins are increasing from 38.5 to 40. Our profit from 160 million to doubling it almost to 305. Tax rate stays the same. Our net profit margin is creeping on up. Look at NMF, NMF, NMF. 3.3 to 5.1. They're flipping in the right direction. They're consolidating everything. They're taking down debt. They're buying back shares. They're watching their margins. Everything that you would want a stock to do. Their long-term debt, they plan on peeling that back some. And my big thing is I'm watching my return on total, uh, return on shareholder equity. Is it moving forward? No meaningful data with all the money they're putting forward. Are they getting a return on their investment? It's going to go to 8% this year, they feel, and forward to 12%. So I'm looking at numbers. This is one of those stocks that doesn't really fit an SSG at all. And I'm looking at numbers and determining by numbers. Next slide. This is what Value Line said, that they feel that they're signing up new customers and will be able to benefit from price increases. Because does anybody have a cable company and they don't increase prices? And they have many different service areas that they can do it. They're going to get a potential acquisition of 120,000 wireless customers that they feel will close, which is gonna occur later this year. They think the synergies increase. Uh, will achieve by their integration of its Puerto Rican operations. This could help their margins again. And they're reducing their debt with those 1300 towers, cell phone towers I told you about in the Caribbean and Panama. 
It's also, you know, less debt because of the cell phone towers, they'll be able to increase their margins. We think earnings per share will growth from the intermittent stock repurchases over the year, profits per share will advance to 80 cents this year, a dollar in 2025, a dollar 60 by 2027 to 2029. So you're gonna go from negative earnings to this year to positive earnings and in five years, double it. Next slide. So I hope you will consider Liberty Latin America in your portfolio, L-I-L-A. Thank Thanks, you. Jim. I was gonna mention you'll be able to see some of those towers from the boat. <laughs> Probably. Uh, right. Jim, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, Janet out in the audience would like to know, uh, how exactly are they making money? Is this purely a cable play? No. They have cell phone providers. They have, um, what is there? They also have a data centers, hosting and managed solutions, IT technology. So it's all kinds of different things with using a cable. <laughs> oh, excuse me, uh, Kim. And Kim Shirley would like to know where are they headquartered? Do you know? Colorado. Okay. And Pat would like to know. Uh, where will the internet come from for all these services if the company doesn't have towers? In the ground, they actually have um, an underground um, subterranean area that they've got the cable in the ground. Okay, and then Nick is asking a question. You mentioned doubling in price. Uh, what's the time frame for that doubling in price? Is it a year, two years, five years? What was the time frame you were uh, talking about? Well, if you go back, Mark, to the value line sheet, they're saying to 2029, the price could go to $17 or a high of 30. So if currently we're at $6.89 in five years. If you get to 17, that would be a more than a double. If it gets to 30, you've got a five three bagger. to four bag. Yeah, five bagger. You've got your okay. own island in the Caribbean at that point. All right. <laughs> Thanks, well, Kim. Uh, we yeah. did get a comment also that Warren Buffett is is buying up some of these shares that, as well. I saw that too. Okay, yeah. uh, we're we're getting a little bit of dispute, uh, Kim, and and I'm not going to take the argument uh, online very far, but we have some people telling us that that uh, Yahoo is saying that they're headquartered in Bermuda, and the question arises: Is this going to be a tax hassle if you buy it? When I looked at the website itself, it told me Colorado. I would have to do more, inf go look for more information on the stock and go through for more stuff. So I, I can't say if it's, I know what the website I saw said Colorado. And if you have it, then it may, it could be a tax hassle. Okay, I do have a hand in the air. Janet, uh, I'm, you'll have to unmute yourself if you wish to speak, Janet. Uh, I have you unmuted, but you're, you're muted on your end. Uh, I think you answered my question, but thank you. Okay, thank you. And okay. Frank also has a hand in the air. Frank, uh, uh, you'll have to unmute yourself uh, right now as well. You're muted on your side. No, I went, I went to the... <clears throat> uh, annual report and it says uh, Bermuda as their state of incorporation or organization on their annual report. Okay. okay thanks. Thanks a lot, Frank. And uh, Kim, I'm getting comments from the audience that indicates that Mr. Malone lives in Colorado, but that the company is headquartered somewhere else. Could be, because I know Malone lives in Colorado. Yes, and I'm getting lots of lots of confirmation from lots of people in the audience uh, 
with this instant information at your fingertips. Everybody can look it up, and they're looking it up, and it looks like they are uh, headquartered in Bermuda, uh, Kim. Okay? All right. Thank you for the correction. Are we ready to move yeah. on? I think we're ready to move on to our final presentation here, Mark. Oh, sure. Mark, please. <laughs> <laughs> Did we clear this with Natalie? No, we didn't. So let's keep moving, okay? okay well, you know, it, it is spring break time. I'm heading out here when we're done, and then Ken wanted to show off his chiseled physique. So, All right. No, I wanted to share some uh, a, a tiny slice of what we do at our bowl sessions uh, as it relates to uh, – the and, and folks, believe me, it has nothing to do with this slide, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will move on. All right. We spent a few moments talking about David Gardner of The Motley Fool and his preference or passion for picking what he calls rule breakers. We would also know them as non-core or special situation stocks. And I just wanted to make the point, uh, in the, the Motley Fool Investment Guide, they have a chapter on these rule breakers. And this first group of companies basically is what he talks about. He talks about America Online in 1994 and Amazon back in 1997 and the massive returns that they achieved on these particular rule breakers. But then he also cautions that they also had positions in Sonic Solutions and ATC Communications, and these were not as glamorous. But when you take his results over the last – we did a report on this – Eight years ago, as a cover story, I'm pr probably going to do another one for April Fool's Day. I expect him to come in at about a 5% advantage or relative return, but uh, this is pre-audit so far. But you can see the type of companies. And here are some of the actual picks made for the Stock Advisor newsletter and featured as these rule breakers. And there's some that are just simply out of the park. And uh, this is this is literally almost a random list. He has picked Disney five times. That's the best performing position, by the way. And you, you just see from top to bottom some interesting names, some interesting results. And uh, that motto up at the top basically says that if you can find a company like this and you can muster the, the courage to stay in it when you're tested, um, it can make a lot of sense. This is another thing that we have pointed out a couple of times, more than a couple can, at uh, the round table, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have some losses, but some of those winners can dramatically offset your losers. And in, in the case of the round table specifically, our gains on Microsoft in that in that uh, dashboard that Ken talked about earlier in the presentation, our gains on Microsoft completely erase or offset all of the other losses realized or unrealized in the portfolio. It's just phenomenal when you think about it. A lot of upside here. So here are the six characteristics. I'm not going to dig into them in any detail. Um, we just tried to compare it, how David thinks about them and how he defines them and then how we kind of look at them. So again, a lot of times if you do the stuff on the left, you get what's on the right. So we we like up straight and parallel. We like quality. We like comparisons for gr between growth and profitability between peers and competitors. We like companies that demonstrate they know what they're doing. Uh, we love solid balance sheets. We love companies that demonstrate they can efficiently utilize capital. Um, good story just simply means it just makes sense. It's in a growth area. And um, this one down here is probably the, the warning to many of us in our community. Every once in a while, we will get kind of hung up on a PE of, 40, 50, or 80, when it's really a, a company at the stage in its life cycle where you shouldn't even be looking at the P-E ratio. And uh, so you want to be careful with that one. You don't want to discard something on that single piece of information. And we talked about that this afternoon. Here are the screening results. Uh, I talked about this this afternoon that I, I don't think I have ever done screening using an industry characteristic. And here it is on here. I basically used the rule breaker concept of let's look for companies with double digit growth, not only in the company itself, but in the industry. And that really filtered down the group quite a bit. Still looking for companies with nice, 
projected annual returns. We want excellent quality where we can get it. Uh, we want the projected return on value to our enterprise value to align or you know line up pretty similarly to the projected annual return. Sometimes the RSI can trigger a potential buying opportunity when that gets down to less than 30. This one's kind of interesting down here. I might have to take a closer look at that one in the morning. But again, you can see some of the, the fundamental analysis from value line. You can see the price to fair value uh, from the analyst consensus and Morningstar. Anytime it's below 100, it's, it's theoretically or potentially on sale. And uh, a lot of these ring up pretty good. The one that kind of caught my attention was the one that's probably a, a little bit boring, but it meets the brand part of David Gardner's uh, definition, Churchill Downs. A uh, stock that's probably not a surprise to many people. But uh, Cy Lynch and I went looking for Churchill Downs in Lexington, Kentucky, one night until we realized we were looking in the wrong place. Now, he's going to try to blame me for being in Lexington instead of Louisville, but that's uh, that's him. That's on him. Um, actually made a trip for a destination wedding to Louisville last year and went and actually walked on that track. Uh, no horses were running at the time. But uh, there's a picture of Churchill Downs. You guys all know this one. And by the way, they are going to be celebrating the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby here very, very soon. So I, and you I cannot... know it usually is always run, Mark, on the day of the Berkshire Annual Meeting. It's what is that? The May first Fourth. weekend in May, right? Yeah, first weekend in May. Yep. First Saturday. So get out there and get your your hats and your sarsaparillas. Uh, but hey, Mark, the, I don't I don't usually interrupt a presentation, but what I found really interesting about your screening list is that four companies on that list are on our best small companies list. Uh, you know, this is a pretty short list, and to find four of our companies on that list says something. Yeah, and the other thing that I wanted to point out, because uh, somebody made a comment in the forum about the number of medical device companies that keep popping up. And I would just point out that medical the, the medical device industry has really been kind of wrecked for the last year or so, maybe two years. So I do think that there's a a probability of opportunity starting to erupt in some of those areas. I, the, Lantheus is one of them. That's one of our best small companies. And Aratomed is your Ken's pick from last month. Globus was mentioned by Gardner and other stuff. Uh, in mode probably qualifies also. Cy brought that one recently. So, and of course, some are scientific down at the bottom. I missed Shockwave on here, but maybe for another day. Yep. <laughs> you know, the ones that bother me, those airports in Mexico, I don't know what to do with those and some of those Chinese companies. D local is an interesting uh, first glance for sure. Ticker symbol DLO. Uh, I had not heard of the company and it's it's, it's worth a closer look. All right, so there it is. Um, that's not all that they do. They they are involved with casinos nationwide, just to give you a little bit more background on the company. So it's a, a very established company with uh, lots of different options for horse racing and uh, that type of thing. And the other thing that I would leave you with is if you're watching the NCAA basketball tournament, you see a commercial from one of these two about every 4.2 minutes. So uh, that's a force, and they are affiliated with uh, Churchill Downs. They actually have uh, a partnership agreement with Churchill Downs. So with that in mind, I thought I'd start at the bottom of the page and just make some points here. Um, they have a little debt, but their interest rate is 3%, so that looks pretty good. It checks in as a buy somewhere in that 125 range. The price range, this is what's expected over the next year, They're down towards the lower end of that. We'd like to see that a little bit lower, but not too bad. The value line low, total return forecast, it's not Kim Butcher's greed is good, 39% or whatever she had up there, 49%, but 14 is not bad. Um, Morningstar thinks they're fairly valued, but the analyst consensus disagrees. They definitely dissent, and uh, there's some pretty interesting things happening here. With the, the stuff that they're doing with the casino expansions and the partnerships with those two other firms, I think we see a company in transformation achieving interesting levels of projected profitability. Again, I think you Mark, can look at this. Go ahead, Ken. Mark, can you do can you do one or two sentences on MFI? Yeah, I will. 
Okay, so down here at the bottom, this MFI, I don't know if I have a chart in here to show it, but on a long-term chart, we look at the money flow index, which is the same, basically the same thing as the relative strength index. It basically measures momentum in the stock, only the money flow index is volume adjusted or corrected. So the money flow index actually had, you know, the, the way that the metric is prepared incorporates the effect of large or small volumes. So we look for that one also to be uh, lower than 20, to be, you know, very attractively on sale. And if it gets up above 80, perhaps 90, uh, a company that could be considered for selling off. Um, so, so again, I think you can look at this picture and see a mid-teens uh, net profit margin. I think that's important. They're operating in the 30-ish range on operating margin. I think you look at the historical P.E. ratio, and it'd be kind of easy to sell your investment club partners on something in the, oh, I don't know, 20-ish range. Something near 20 would be, seems practical and reasonable. So here's a look at the stock selection guide with uh, where we usually start. Um, we start with sales. Again, the company has been kind of transforming some of the stuff that they've been doing. The additions, the bolt-ons, and the partnerships has resulted in a little bit of a newer company. And uh, that growth rate is somewhere in the 14 to 15% range. Uh, again, not flashy, but pretty solid. Um, the net margin, again, we, we saw that somewhere in the mid-teens is pretty good, so 18.4 works. Notice that the P.E. ratio has only once in the last 10 or 11 years been down around 20. So a P.E. ratio of 20 does imply perhaps a little bit of conservatism. And uh, we're basically looking at a earnings per share growth rate of approximately 20%. The par, 15.8, is attractive. Decent financial strength, decent quality. It's it's not uh, the top of the quality pile or the core score pile that you're, you're going to have, but decent projected operating margins. Again, remember they were fairly consistent on that picture on the preceding page, and that gives us a projected return on value of 11.3%. So again, up straight and parallel for this company going forward. COVID hit them like a hammer. So you kind of disregard that year. You can see that the projected annual return is near multi-year highs. The company has floated in the excellent quality range throughout that entire uh, decade of history. So I was kind of surprised to end up at this point. You know, I was surprised to end up and uh, be shown this company by virtue of that 10% growth limitation on the industry. Um, much like a rule breaker, so I, I'm kind of intrigued at what that uh, that process led me to. Um, I was going to try to find a picture of me hanging from the horse or with my arm around his neck. I have one somewhere. Couldn't find it, but there it is, just a reminder. Churchill Downs, I would recommend it. It's a great museum, uh, great experience, and uh, some pretty good food in the Louisville area. That's Man of War, isn't it, Mark? I think that is Man of War. I think yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh-huh. And meat juleps are excellent also. Absolutely. And so with that, you saw me and Ken headed for the spring break beach party. I just wanted to offer this up for when that crowd gets the munchies. That is a poor choice <laughs> out there for when they get the munchies. All right. And with that, we can go ahead and open the poll, Ken. Just give me one second here. Okay, let's try it. Uh, folks, uh, just help us choose an extra $1,000 to go into one of these uh, particular companies. Uh, if you don't like any of them, uh, tell us you don't like any of them, but vote for none of the above, okay? Uh, we'd love to see 85-90% uh, of you voting. We're already up to 70 74 percent so we don't need very many more of you to press the button to hit that goal very uh, decisive. doesn't doesn't cost you anything uh i'm going to kind kind of count to 10 backwards here to give those of you that are vacillating a couple of seconds to make your final decision 
Uh, I'm hoping to just think it up to 90. Uh, we're at 89. Come on, give me one more, two more, three more votes. Come on, folks. Okay. Oh, please. Uh, they, well, they, they called. They called the race. Long ago. <laughs> Uh, and we're going to close the poll and we're going to share the results, okay? We did have 89 plus percent of you voting, not quite 90 percent, okay? And uh, we're going to add a position in Excel uh, Service Holdings, Mark, an extra position well, in that company. In that okay? case, Kim, I think we have to demand that Ken change his middle name to secret Secretariat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm developing a long list of names here, Mark, so just, <laughs> just add it on, okay? All right. Here's a reminder that we do place all of these sessions on YouTube. If you go to YouTube, search on Manifest Investing Roundtable, you will find the bull sessions and the roundtables. Today's bull session is already up there, and I'm just amazed that 30 or 40 of you have already taken a look. So uh, that, that was a lot of fun. And... Uh, some good times. This is, by the way, a fairly interesting discussion of NVIDIA and uh, how uncharacteristic it is. By the way, David Gardner, as a rule breaker, put NVIDIA in the portfolio back in 2005. Let that sink in. Uh, Mark, I have a question for you from Nick in the audience. Uh, are those industry growth numbers something that is proprietary? Is it coming from Y charts, or is it part of the data set that he can use to help screen from? We actually just uh, average the stuff that's in our data, our universe, our database. But there are industry averages that can be uh, obtained via Morningstar. I can do I can do a little bit deeper digging, and we can also get uh, industry um, average growth rates via uh, Y charts. Okay, great. I'll, I'll take that under uh, advisement. With that, Mark, we've uh, kept the questions uh, right uh, pretty close to uh, the vest here. So we've answered an awful lot of them. Uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, uh, Len is suggesting that you want to go out and play the ponies. But other than that, uh, you know, and <laughs> hot dog in one hand, $5 bill in the other. So you're, <laughs> you're all set. Okay. Uh, and without any more questions or anything else, uh, I'd like to, to say thank you to you and to Kim and to thanks, uh, big thanks to our audience uh, for showing up. We don't do this for uh, our own pleasure, although we take a lot of pleasure in doing it. Uh, we love to share what we have to think about stocks with our audience, and we had a good one tonight. Uh, we hope to see you all at a future bull session, and we hope to see you all uh, at the roundtable a month from now. And folks, kind of watch very carefully. We're going to make a time change in the roundtable, and next month's roundtable will begin at 8 p.m., Eastern Time, not 8.30, 8 p.m. for next month's roundtable, and that'll be our starting time going forward from now on. Last Tuesday of the month in April, and we hope to see you then, St. Louis. Here we come. Thanks, Ken. Good night, everybody. Happy Easter. <laughs> <laughs>